Well, we made it. We made it to Christmas. And we've been busy, haven't we? Has anybody here been busy? Is it only me or is it everybody else been busy, right? Since Thanksgiving morning, stores were open on Thanksgiving. Some of the stores were open on Thanksgiving. We've been shopping since Thanksgiving. Some of us who are pre-planners have been shopping way before Thanksgiving. But we've been doing a lot of shopping to the tune of what they think that that we spent as a nation $10 billion this past Saturday. $10 billion just in one day, retail sales, which surpassed Black Friday. And so we spent a lot of sh time shopping this season. And the malls opened up at 7 a.m. We had 24-hour stores open 24 hours a day. And if you, I know some people would go late at night or early in the morning to miss all the crowds and the traffic and everything. So we, we've been busy shopping. But that's not the only thing we've been doing. What else have we been doing? We've been baking cookies. How many people bake cookies here this, week? Yeah, this season? Yeah. And you didn't bring me any? What, what's going on? <laughs> so, did you? Good. So we got, um, what we sent Christmas cards, right? We sent Christmas cards. Who, who watched some Christmas movies? Yeah, I watched some Christmas movies this season. We did a lot of things. Then we all, some of us went out into fields and looked at trees and cut one down. Or some of others of us went to Costco or Home Depot and got a tree. Or some of us just went in our basement and pulled it out of a box, <laughs> pre-lit, the smart people. <laughs> and we decorated our houses, right? We decorated them. In fact, our houses have been transformed on the outside. We put up lights and lights, and we try to put up more lights than our neighbor put up. Although I like the light display here. I think it's a local light display. You know, the down the street, they've got a big display, and I think the neighbor put their lights up, but it's just a lighted sign that says ditto, which I thought was <laughs> genius. Don't have to do all the work and get, all, get your same kind of credit, you know. But we do. We put all these lights up, and we, we do all this decorating, and our houses get transformed. I know my house has been transformed from ordinary decorations, and now we got pine-scented candles, and we got you know, snowmen and snowflakes and lights and garlands and Santas. There's even a Santa in our bathroom. <laughs> like, I don't know why I need to see Santa in there. I just don't know why. <laughs> but we've been doing all this, and then for us, we put out a nativity set. And uh, it turns out that, when, that I, I, we're not the only ones that have been decorating this Christmas. I think somebody else that we know pretty popular has been also decorating this is Pope Francis looking at some Christmas decorations in the Vatican basement. I think he's looking for the, looking for the nativity set. It goes out in St. Peter's Square, according to The Onion, which is a satire magazine. That's where I got that. But we've all been decorating. We go get that nativity set in the basement, and we pull it out. And we put it all out on the tables or on our, on our uh, tables or somewhere in our house, and we pull it out, and we put out the baby Jesus, and then we think it's complete right? We think we're, we're, we're done. And my question is, in the midst of all that busyness, has Jesus just become another ornament? Has Jesus become just another decoration in the house or just another thing to check off the Christmas list? Or did Jesus, was Jesus to be something more? I think we came here tonight not simply to add to our to-do list, I think we came because we were hoping there was more to Christmas than everything we just did. I think we came here tonight because we want to know there's more to life and to Christmas than just decorations. We want to know and we want to find the real Jesus. Well, you want to know how to find the real Jesus? <laughs> you know what the message was to the shepherds that night? The angels said to the shepherds, you want to know what the, they said to them in a nutshell? You want to know? Yeah, come on. Yeah, that's what I'm listening for. Yeah. <laughs> Egg me on. Here we go. This is a good, I'll show you what the angel said, right? All right, there you go. That's right. Can you read that? Right. If you came to the earlier services, we, all the ushers were wearing these, and they all took them off. I don't know what they did. You know, they're all in nice tie, red ties tonight now. But that's part of it, is keep calm. <laughs> now, have you felt very calm over the past four weeks? No. no. 
But it, 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 these guys sang about the stillness, the calm. We'll sing about a silent night. It's in the calmness, it's in the stillness, it's not in the busyness that we'll find Jesus. And it's interesting because who were the people that were calm and still that night Jesus was born? Wasn't it not the shepherds? You know, was it not the shepherds out in their fields? They were calm and still and serene. They were watching the sheep. They were settled in for the night. And so God comes, the angels come to these, these shepherds. It's interesting because God comes to those who aren't preoccupied with what's going on in Bethlehem, aren't preoccupied with the census, aren't preoccupied with getting a room at the inn, aren't preoccupied with all the food and, the, and connecting with other people. And they're the ones that aren't preoccupied. And it's people who aren't preoccupied, aren't too preoccupied, that find Jesus. Because it's our, sometimes our preoccupations that get in the way of things. Take, for example, the miracle of the cell phone. Well, I don't know if we call it a miracle. But we all have smartphones, right? We have cell phones. I learned a new term this week I get to share with you. It's called an EDI, EDI, which stands for Electronic Display of Insensitivity. <laughs> electronic Display of Insensitivity. Now, this is what happens. This is the term for what happens when we're in a conversation with somebody, we're having lunch with somebody, we're talking to somebody, and all of a sudden that cell phone starts to go off, vibrate or whatever, and they immediately ignore you and start to look at their phone and do whatever they need to pay attention to on their phone, and they deal with it, and they may come back to you after a little bit, and then all of a sudden after it's done, then, they, oh, then they're back to you. That's called an EDI an electronic display of insensitivity. And they're actually finding that this is disrupting and ruining relationships. That technology is getting in the way of our relationships. And how often are we preoccupied with that little square rectangle? I know, I know I am. What's that? How, yeah, exactly. Yeah, look at this over here, right? Uh, that, she, was, she was a plant. She was a plant. So... But think about that, Recta, how often do we do that? How often does that become a preoccupation, whether it's uh, playing a game or answering texts or whatever it is or checking something on their phone? It becomes this preoccupation. And what they're saying in these, uh, as they study this more, they're saying this is getting in the way of our relationships, these preoccupations, this preoccupation. I wonder if that happens to us too in our relationship with God. That maybe all that we've been doing all season is all this preparation has just been a preoccupation and not helping us to really find Jesus. And so how do we let go of some of that? How do we become still? How do we become calm? And how do we just relax, just chill out? I think the other thing we learn from the shepherds is that shepherd, shepherds are people who aren't too proud to find Jesus. In fact, shepherds were the humble, lowly shepherds referred to in Scripture. And it's interesting because shepherds were not always, they were more tolerated in the first century. They weren't, for one reason, they, they didn't smell great. They usually, you know, didn't uh, keep the cleanliness laws. Um, they didn't keep rituals. They couldn't go to synagogue. They couldn't go to church because of the uncleanliness from hanging around with animals and being out in the fields. And they would make camp out in the fields with the sheep, and they, would, they, were, they camped out all the time. The other thing is, is that they had to take their sheep to different pastures, and they had to graze their sheep in different pastures, and other people owned the land that those pastures had. And so they would have to graze their sheep on other people's property to take care of the sheep, especially if they weren't the landowner's sheep. So can you imagine going home tonight, and you drive in your driveway, and there's this flock of sheep and some shepherds standing in to eat because they like your lawn. You know, it looked really good. So they decided to just park themselves on your property. How would you feel about that, right? You wouldn't really like it. And if you, now you know how the people in the first century felt about shepherds. They kind of just tolerated them. They knew it would happen, but they tolerated them. But they, so they were very, always considered very humble, lowly people. And so when the angels come to them and say, go find Jesus, they're ready. I do wonder, though, and this is just my imagination playing here, because somebody had to stay with the sheep, right? I mean, they didn't just all run off and the sheep were left out there in the pasture because we know what sheep do if they're left alone. 
So did some of them go, I'm not going, you go. Were some of them too proud to go? Or did some of them not want to go to find Jesus? They were like, oh, big deal. Maybe they were, I don't know. But somebody had to stay behind. I don't know how they made that decision. But I think sometimes we also make decisions too of whether or not we're going to seek Jesus or whether maybe we just don't feel like it's necessary. It's not that important. I, was, uh, take, I took a mission trip, youth on a mission trip many years ago and uh, when I was a youth pastor and I was taking them to Reynosa, Mexico, which is just across the border uh, from McAllen, Texas. And we took a group down there, about a dozen young people, and we got on the plane, we got down there. The first day we were, tra- we were in training orientation for, the, for our work that week, and we were working with people who lived in a landfill, uh, who squatted on a landfill in Reynosa, Mexico. So these were very poor, extreme poverty. And we were getting ready to go in there, and one of our young men, Nathan, was on a trip, and the whole day we're in training and orientation, you know, the leaders are trying to tell us what we're going to encounter, and he's sitting back there in the back row, head down, not wanting to, I could tell his whole body language saying, I don't want to be here. And, you know, I knew his parents made him come. But he was determined not to get involved, not determined to participate. He was there under duress. It got so bad, he, Nathan got so bad about this, he wasn't participating, he wasn't talking to anybody, he didn't want to be there, he wanted to go home. Day two, we're getting ready to get on the van to travel from McAllen, Texas, to take the journey over to Reynosa, Mexico, go over the border, and he says, I'm not getting in the van. And uh, so I've got to make a, a call. And I finally looked at Nathan and I said, look, Nathan, you can get in this van or I can call your parents and they can get you on a plane and we'll get you on a plane and you can go home. Your choice, your, your choice. I, I think you ought to get on the van. Just your choice. And I said, so what are you going to do? And so he reluctantly got on the van. And he went through that day, and he got through that day, and then the next day, but I watched Nathan change right before my eyes every day. The last day we were there, we were cleaning up our site, saying goodbye to everybody, saying goodbye to the people that we've been working with, and I said, Nathan, it's time to get on the van. You know what? He didn't want to get back on the van, but for a different reason. He actually broke down, and he said, I can't leave. How can we leave? There's so much that needs to be done here. And so I saw this young man who didn't want to be there, who didn't want to take the journey, and I watched as he humbled himself to the journey that that he was on. And as he humbled himself to that journey and made the journey, his life was changed. And that's what God does. (laughs) Isn't that what God did to the shepherds? That when they were willing to make the journey, when they were willing to be humble enough and take the time and stop being preoccupied, when they were willing to do those things and make the journey to go find Jesus, their lives were changed forever. In fact, let's take a look at how. I want you to see how their lives were changed. Let's go back to the text tonight. Let's read, first of all, what the angels said to the shepherds. Some of what the angels said to the shepherds in the first part. Let's read this together. Luke chapter 2. 13, 14. Let's all read out loud this together. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Then the shepherds hear that announcement. They go find Jesus. They see Jesus in the manger just like it had been told them. And then verse 20, the very last verse we read, I want you to see what the shepherds did as a response to seeing Jesus. And let's read this out loud together. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So we've got angels glorifying and praising God to the shepherds. And the result of the shepherds going and seeing the child in the manger, what's their response? What do they end up doing? They end up glorifying and praising God as well. So here's what happens. The shepherds become angels, and they go tell others the same message. Glorify and praise God. That's the great good news, folks, of of what God does. God takes ordinary, lowly shepherds and transforms them, changes them into angels. 
Now, I know you may find this hard to believe, especially those of you who may be married, but God can do the same thing in your life. God can take the same, us, ordinary people, that when we humble ourselves and take the time to make the journey, God can change our lives and we become God's angels once we find Jesus. And once we find Jesus, we can become angels. God's in the business of making sinners into saints. That's what it does. Some of us, it takes a really long time. Sometimes it happened instantaneously. There was a man who did happen instantaneously. His name was Blaise Pascal. Any mathematicians in the house tonight? Got any mathematic people in the house? Pascal was a a well-known mathematician and philosopher. How many people have ever used a calculator? You've used something that was invented by Blaise Pascal. Later in life, he was depressed, unhappy, not content with his life, didn't know what was wrong. And then people noticed that he went from being this pessimistic kind of depressed person to all of a sudden he started having this, this, this happiness and this joy about him in his life. And he started to take spiritual retreats and he started to write about Christian philosophy and write about Christianity. And so people knew that something had happened to him, something had changed in him that transformed his life. But they couldn't put a finger on what it was exactly until he died. And when he died, his nephew was cleaning out his living quarters, and he came across his coat. And as he was picking up the coat, he felt something inside the coat, actually sewn inside the coat. And it was a journal entry from his journal that he had sewn into the inside of his coat so that it would always be next to him. So, and it was dated seven years before that day that he died. Seven years ago to that a day, November 23rd, 1654, his journal said the journal entry, and he had sewn in there, and I want to share with you what part of what that journal entry said. It said this, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, joy, 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 tears of joy. For some reason, he did not want to forget that moment. And we believe, those who have studied him, believe that that's the moment that Christ came into his life. And that's why he kept it so close to him. And that's what changed his heart. That's what changed his mind. That's what changed his life. And he wanted to tell others about it. And that's what he started writing, Christian Christian philosophy. The point is, folks, the angels came with good news of how much joy? Great joy. And whenever we find Jesus, whenever we find Christ and he lives in us, we experience everlasting joy. Not the Christmas spirit, but everlasting joy. Amen.